Hello. Hey, Should Connor? the government have a right to own private businesses? Let's discuss. So welcome, everyone. Oh, that's a hot topic. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is the Forge and start, Anvil podcast. Right on, yeah, you're starting off right, on, right at the, the 10 decimal. <laughs> Oh, yeah. We're going to go straight into it. So we are joined today with uh, Terry Lynn Weaver, who is a uh, has been a representative um, in the Tennessee state legislature for a long time. So Terry Lynn, who are you? Tell the audience about you. Well, thank you, first of all, uh, Connor, for inviting me to this amazing podcast of you. I congratulate you for informing the people what's going on. So that's that's good stuff. Um, no, um, um, I am a, yeah. uh, I'm a follower of Christ, number one, and I'm a wife, uh, a mother, a grandmother of two, a former state representative of 14 years in the state house of Tennessee, this awesome state, and a uh, singer-songwriter, and I'm about to uh, dive into a new adventure as an author, so I'm working on that as well. That's going to take me a couple years, but... Uh, I'm looking forward to having my first book on the shelf back here somewhere. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And then it'll end up on this shelf too, hopefully. Yes. Well, I would so. hope, I would hope at least, you know, my closest friends ho hopefully will buy a copy. Maybe I'll sell a couple hundred. I don't know. <laughs> we'll awesome. See. Cool. Well, we'll definitely have to talk more about that a little later on in the episode, but uh, I wanted to start off by asking why on earth would a Christian decide to get political at all, let alone hold office? Well, you know, as you know, uh, we could sure use a little bit of influence. We could use our Christian morals and values and virtue in the public square. And, um, and especially a calling, you know, uh, Connor, I didn't look for this job. I was doing perfectly fine touring and singing and playing guitar and the good news and then uh i, I really felt called to to do this when it came across my desk after much prayer and you know didn't even think i had the skill sets to do it but but back to your question why should we i think number one um we definitely need our a christian influence in the public square and we also need to have people that understand our american republic and how our founders really emphasize small government and more freedom. And of course, as you know, our, our whole system, our documents, um, our whole foundation of this country is a Christian nation and people debate that over and over and over again. But the proofs in the Putin, when you read the Federalist Papers and you read the journals of our founders, these were men uh, and women who influenced their husbands. These were men and women who loved God and loved this country and really believed that we have a purpose for this country. And so when you, when you dissect that down into states, we need people in state legislature who understand that and understand that uh, being in politics is not to serve you, it's to serve others and to, um, I guess, protect um, our nation and state going forward for the good of our grandchildren. And that's, that, you know, to me, that was my calling and that's what I, I had hoped and I really felt I did. I was one of these individuals who looked at a piece of legislation and said, well, one, does it grow government? How much does it cost? And two, is this something good for my constituents? And uh, would this be something that the founders would um, embrace? And so uh, that's how I looked at legislation. And I enjoyed serving the people of Tennessee. It truly was an honor, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And you ended up serving for, was it 14 years in the legislature? Yes, sure was. It went by fast, that's for sure. Wow. So during that time, I'm sure you had a lot of different battles and a lot of different stories that you could tell. So let's let's start off by asking, what were some of your biggest victories during your time in office? Well, I um, always worked at protecting the children. So I was always involved in the discussion of protecting not only a child in the womb, but our children in school and our children... Um, uh, basically throughout our state. So I served on committees that dealt with that, especially in education. I was very concerned about uh, content, what was before our children. I was uh, very much involved in the, uh, the textbook commission and making sure we had people on there who had good eyes for what was in front of our children. 
Um, um, and, and so uh, the uh, some other legislation that I was very, very proud of was the um, the Tenth Amendment standing, and that one involved a, a lawsuit that went all the way to the Supreme Court. We were asking the state of Tennessee was asking the Supreme Court, does the state of Tennessee have standing when it comes to refugees? Um, as you know, now this was five or six years ago. Now look where we are today, where we have this invasion at our border and uh we were asking does you know does tennessee have standing and who comes to our state and who pays for all this and uh you know what's our place in line and so uh long story short it went all the way to the supreme court but then i had the powers that be in the uh, state of tennessee didn't want to support that piece of legislation and so it just kind of went by the wayside unfortunately but i was very proud of that because i worked hard at making the argument and sometimes that's what happens you you work you you bring it up like in this case to the supreme court but, uh of the highest court of the land i was proud of the fact that i was able to get legislation that far yeah. that was a problem yeah absolutely that's a process in itself and yeah. it's a long journey from uh small courts in Tennessee all the way up to the Supreme Court. So oh, gosh, yes, as you know, it goes through all those appeals and I mean, those appellate courts and stuff. So another piece of legislation that I was very proud of was eliminating the death tax in the state of Tennessee. That was something that I worked hard on. I didn't carry the legislation, but I worked in the uh, back um, behind the scenes, which I like to do that actually better. I don't really care who carries the bill as long as it gets passed and it's good for the state. That's good for me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, the pieces of legislation that I know that you um, you've had some strong opinions on education in general in the state of Tennessee. Yeah. Um, you've had a lot of opinions on the school voucher program here, and I think you have a kind of a unique perspective on it. So can you explain your stance to the audience as well as explain like your issues with the voucher program? Sure. Well, first of all, um, I traveled my my district every other year. I did um, <clears throat> school tours. You know, for years I toured doing music, but every other year, as a state legislator, I went to my schools. I took a notebook. I took notes, and the people in my district, <clears throat> you know, I'm a rural Tennessee. People in my district are, are very the 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 schools are the hub of the community, and so. <clears throat> I want to know, well, what do you think about vouchers? And, and, and to the people in my district, they weren't favorable to them, number one. First of all, um, we're so rural. Uh, parents, you know, work. They, they rely on school buses to get their kids to school. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is I'd rather focus on the public school system and make it the best we can be. And if, this, if the parent doesn't... Uh, want to keep their kids in public school, which I didn't. I, our, our child was homeschooled. You can have that option. So the argument was, well, you know, we need to have school choice. Well, we have choice. If you don't like the public schools, you can homeschool or you can send them to a Christian school. Um, but the, uh, the biggest part of my argument, Connor, is the fact that anytime government touches any kind, it has any kind of uh, money to it and this voucher system is like a coupon if you will and you give your child Johnny a coupon to go to any school you want to go to if that coupon is touched with state and federal money there comes control and we know this to be a fact in every department anytime you take state government federal government it comes with a a, a control and you do their bidding. We've seen it in higher education. We've seen it in the last, you know, in, the, in this administration. If the colleges don't do um, what they're supposed to do with transgender or or any kind of their, what am I trying to say? Their the, uh, their ideology. If you don't do it, you don't get the funds. Hmm. So I I'm just a proponent of number one. Don't get involved with getting money from government. Uh, Hillsdale College is a prime example. They don't take any federal funding, yeah. and they can teach whatever they want, and they're not um, politicized. That same thread is in our Christian schools, and I'm finding out that a lot of Christian schools in the state of Tennessee are getting a hold of this and saying, oh, wait a minute, 
I don't think we want to get involved in that. We're going to push that away, even though it might look friendly at first. But uh, the question I always ask is, well, how long will it be before you, Christian school, will not be able to teach Bible 101 because this voucher or this coupon with this student and this parent doesn't agree with the way you're teaching it? And then here you have lawsuits, and instead of Christian schools doing what they they, their passion is, and that's to teach the gospel and to teach sure. classical education. They're going to be all wrapped up in lawsuits and not be able to teach what they want to do. So my my advice to them is don't do it. Keep it away um, and don't accept a voucher system. I don't think it's constitutional, number one. So mm, yeah. that's been my argument. Uh, it's like a Trojan horse going into Christian schools. And then you have the homeschool issue. Homeschoolers never, ever want any kind of federal money, even when it comes to textbooks, because mm. of the fact that, you know, the reason why I homeschooled my son, I don't want government involvement, period. I want to be able to select the curriculum as a parent, teach my child the way that uh, I feel is right, and not have any influence or pressure by the government. And you would get that if you take their money, period. Mm. That's how it works. Yeah. So obviously from a conservative standpoint and um just thinking about sort of talking point you know kind of conservatism school choice is obviously a huge thing that is constantly pushed by the right side of the aisle so yeah. what do you what do you view as being the proper role or i guess solution to the mess that we currently find ourselves in with education again uh parents have choice uh, Point point is, you know, I, Mike and I, my husband and I, we had a we had a choice with how we wanted to teach our son. We chose to homeschool him. Uh, so nobody said I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't rely on government to buy my books or give me any kind of anything to teach my child. I don't believe that's the role of government. That's parents' role. And as you find out, you know, as, I mean, it's not even enumerated power. Education isn't every, anywhere near there. Scriptures tell us that parents are to train uh, their children in the way that they should go. So I just believe that uh, even though the Constitution of the state of Tennessee says we're, we're supposed to teach children, we're supposed to educate them, uh, again, it comes down to the parents. The parents are 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 the ones who determine how they want to teach their children what they want to teach their children and i just think that government is out of their sandbox when they get involved in that Period. yeah yeah well speaking of being out of their sandbox um you were on the ground working in the legislature during the height of the 2020 lockdowns so um oh. were you happy with the response that tennessee had to the pandemic well, uh, I'm trying to think now. As I look back over it, Connor, um, we were, uh, at the time, one of the most freest states at the time in terms of working and people going about their business. Uh, the part I had a problem with is, <clears throat> number one was the no, no jab, no job. Oh, no job, no, yeah, no jab, no job. And it was, I was getting... Even in rural Tennessee, I was getting, uh, from my constituency, I was getting help. Uh, if we don't get this shot, we're, we're going to be, uh, we're going to lose our job in two to three weeks. Or um, I had an airline uh, pilot who, who was um, almost like a captain, and uh, he had to quit his job because he didn't get the vaccination. So uh, I wasn't happy. And the fact that Tennessee didn't step up to the plate as I thought it should have. And even with our um, military, we have, you know, Clarksville here in Tennessee. I have a lot of friends and acquaintances even in my district that were saying they're going to be, they're going to lose their, their status in the military. And they did. And now look at it. What it was just, what, two or three weeks ago where they said that they are not going to mandate the military to have a vaccination, which right. again, the whole thing was all about control, government control. And uh, a couple of my colleagues and I, we fought for a special session to um, come into play 
to again make a statement number one to stand up for our citizens to stand up for our military to stand up for our constituents and we end up going to a special session to take care of the corporate industry as you know we uh took care of ford motor the most woke corporation in the country to come to memphis uh we gave them incentives and taxpayers from my district put into that to have them come and basically they um they were very adamant and strong armed the legislator in saying don't mess with the jab don't mess with your the covid um rules or we'll not come to tennessee hmm. I, i'm telling you i i'm not for corporate i'm for citizens yeah. and that was what i gave my oath to to protect them from injuriousness and from you know things that um constitutional issues that's that was my stance not to protect corporations and as you know we also in that special session took care of ford first took care of the titans first paid for a stadium that is way out of the sandbox of government and then of course third we got to the um to the jab or the mandate on the vaccines uh after that uh, but to be honest with you connor we really didn't do anything um that helped the little guy we we helped employers and their businesses because republicans don't tell small businesses how to run their their businesses which is baloney because we tell them how to run it all the time we have all kinds of laws you make right. them pay all kinds of taxes so, so again i what in your answer to your question i was not happy i did the best that i could i fought for the citizen and believed that again less is more i am not a big government person never have been i believed in uh, freedom and responsibility and not being uh, taking our our actions from the government and taking our dictates from the government i believe that's dangerous I have a history in my family of my family fleeing communism and mm. it's in my DNA and when I start seeing big government and rules and agenda I'm like push back <laughs> yeah so, but all in all in in terms of the law I never wore a mask not mm. one time I did take uh, hydroxychloroquine once a month I mean once every Sunday I never got sick never wore a mask i was intimidated and told i was being selfish and all that kind of stuff but hey you got to stand on what you believe in and uh and not be intimidated yeah so, it was a rough time it was very lots of tension lots of tempers uh but they put plexiglass in between our our seats on the house floor which was a joke to me that was like I mean, I guess, I guess the business, uh, whoever did that made a whole buttload of money, but <laughs> I just yeah, I'm sure. it was just so stupid. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Good grief. Well, there's a lot of different upcoming challenges for Tennessee. And since you do have a lot of experience, I wanted to kind of uh, maybe pick your brain on some of those challenges. So, uh, one of those challenges is the new bill, um, SJR 0034. So that would make an amendment to our state constitution that would actually allow the state to become shareholders in private banks and private corporations. That was kind of what I was referring to at the top of the episode. So, yeah. so Murphy, merging the private sector and the public sector reminds me of a certain kind of uh, ism. Uh -huh. So uh, can you explain to the audience what this could mean for Tennessee if the bill passes and that amendment is made and how can we go about stopping it? Well, uh, Connor, first and foremost, red, red flag, red flag, red flag, because <clears throat> again, government is not supposed to be involved at what we call it private, public, private um, partnership. It's like the three P's. Hmm. That's very dangerous uh, to me because you're taking taxpayer, your money, your taxpayer money, and you're putting in an investment in a public, I mean, in a private entity. And that private entity is going to hopefully going to make money, but that shouldn't be taxpayer money doing that. Right. That's dangerous. Very dangerous. 
And I know there was legislation to do that um, a couple of years ago on road building and interstates and this, that, and the yeah. other. But Connor, the question has to be asked. We, we generate billions of dollars in the state of Tennessee that we have enough money to deal with roads and infrastructure. Right. Well, what we do, we do this, this private par uh, public partnership yeah. is we're just allowing the government to continue to expand over here and not take care of the responsibility, which is, I, I mean, according to the constitution, the government is supposed to one, protect us, two, provide infrastructure. That means roads and commerce. Those are the two things immediately they're supposed to do, but those are the very things that they don't have the money for because the government's over here somewhere else, over yonder, right. doing something that they're not even supposed to be involved in. Now, they're wanting to make this in the Constitution. That's very dangerous. Anytime yeah. you add anything to our Constitution, number one, there is, a, there is a long process to do that, which I agree should be, and right. should be cumbersome. So it's not something you can do quick right, right away. But uh, no, I would not support this. I would fight against it. I would have constituencies go to the committee meetings, write their state legislature and their senator and the governor and be loud, you know, just be a voice because yeah. uh, they uh, no news to them is good news. And so I would encourage you to write those who are carrying it and and do call the news, do all you can to use any kind yeah. of of uh venue or any kind of resource you have to get the word out but i would no. not i would not support something like that yeah no. absolutely and i think i think the the partnership sounds innocent in itself if, if you just look at it from black and white oh uh, they're going to invest our tax dollars into something that's going to make more money for the state but oh, ultimately yeah. you know that 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 means that they could own stock in um you know anything from from pharmaceutical companies um so that you know if the state wants to make their money they should maybe mandate a shot for example um sure. you know it, it just when when they work hand in hand with with business um when government and private business work together you know that that means that government legislation is going to be written in a way that will maximize profits of this private this private entity that they have <laughs> shareholders in and you know ultimately that means that it's really just it's just the the corporations and the government patting themselves on the back and helping each other out at the expense of the citizen and yeah you know i i think conservatives have this issue uh or i should say maybe republicans not conservatives um there is a distinction there they have an issue of of uh you know wanting to just paint it black and white like well it'll bring about jobs and help the economy and it's like but at what cost and that's what we need to be thinking about in this scenario so um yeah and Connor, I mean, you need to ask the self, you need to ask you know what are the unintended consequences and you touched on that you know the control um, i can think of one government who was very good at this and that's china Mm. And, you know, they, they have influenced our state. We have quite a few into, um, China um, influences here in our own state. It's very alarming to me. And even across our nation, they're buying up farmland. They're buying up yeah. um, uh, uh, real estate that, that is no longer American. And that's very concerning to me. Uh, somebody told me, well, you know, I asked about my concern about all these these." Uh, these China owned companies in Tennessee. And my answer was, Oh, well, we're not, we're not doing business with the government. Well, well, hello. Yes, you are. When it comes to communism in China, you right. are doing business with them. Every and business so, is tied to the government <laughs> yeah, in China. Oh, yeah. Oh, indeed. For sure. So no, I don't think that's a good idea. No. And I would hope that my colleagues down there, yeah. well, my former colleagues would really look into that uh, and really think about the yeah. unintended consequences before uh, going down that road. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of other developments going on right now. Like uh, there's the whole development of the of the smart cities um, starting down in Chattanooga. Have you heard much uh, about that? Uh, I, I have, you know, since I'm not 
in the in the yeah. 113th i haven't dived I, deep into some of the discussions uh, um i will say I, that same thread uh, applies that we just, just talked about with the the private it, public partnership it, that same thread would definitely go into smart uh, cities because if you uh, if, if you read anything about smart cities, they've got all these buzzwords, this word salad of, of, um, oh, what is it? Um, sustainable energy, um, sensors. Um, and of course it's not fossil fuel, it's wind and, um, electric cars. And it's all the things that we don't have. I mean, the things that we have are resources we have here, like coal and oil. Those things are taboo, but to be a smart city, you got to have sustainable energy and all these sensors and all this data grabbing. And you have to ask the question, well, they're getting all this data. So why? So they can control you and I. And when I think about this smart city stuff, I think about, mm, you know what? People don't dumb down, smart up. Yeah. and look into the yeah. intended consequences of smart because who doesn't want better road mobility i mean who doesn't want better roads to get in and out of nashville as you know when you go in there it's a, it's a mess but at the same time what's the cost is it is it worth losing your freedom and your your control for yeah. their yeah. ultimate end and those are the things you got to really think. think through you have to be a free thinker and not just take what they say yeah. but Put it, you know, down yeah. on paper and think about it, pray about it. And yeah. usually, most generally, if you ask for wisdom, James chapter one says he'll give it to you. So yeah. that's what you gotta do. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're running a little bit low on time. We talked about a lot of, you know, um, big topics that we could easily spend hours talking about and unpacking in, in very granular detail. So, um, do you have any maybe encouragement that you can leave us with for this episode? Oh, let's see. Yes, definitely. You know, I think of the first thing I think of is that the uh, government is truly on our, our Lord and Savior's. It's on it's on Jesus Christ's shoulder. He yeah. is the ultimate decision, right? We make our plans. We uh, we do our thing down here. But ultimately, God is that ultimate decision. Um, and I always think of that scripture, Proverbs 3, that uh, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Mm -hmm. But in all of your ways, acknowledge him yeah. and he'll set your path straight. That's, That's such a practical verse for today. Yeah. Some people abide by it. Some decide to do their own thing and then their walls come crashing down. But I would say uh, to trust, trust in the Lord. And, and again, like one of my favorite movies, Lord of the Rings, when Sam, why, <laughs> see, Sam, 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 what was his, uh, Sam, Sam Wise, Gimji. He said uh, that, uh, that in the world, there's going to be all kinds of troubles. I'm trying to think of what he said. Oh, there is some good in the world. He told Frodo yeah. this. He said, there's some good in the world. <clears throat> yep. And I believe yeah. that we all need to find yeah. the good and we need to fight for it, yep. no matter what it is. And uh, uh, it's different things to different yeah. people. So my encouragement to you is do work that's worth doing and never, 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 never give up. Yeah. That's great encouragement. And you ended with Lord of the Rings, which is a, a bonus point for this show because I'm, I'm the biggest... Uh, Tolkien nerd that you'll ever meet. So <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, I can watch that. I can watch that series. In fact, I watch it every year. Uh, as soon as I get through with the chosen episode, I'm going to get out my Lord of the Rings again. So uh, it's I always get something brand new out of it. But yeah. So that's there is awesome. a lot of good in this world. We got a lot of good things in Tennessee. It's such a blessing to live here. We've got amazing people and amazing resources here. Uh, but I would say just. Find the good and fight. fight for it and keep it. Amen to that. I agree. So, Terry Lynn, where can people stay in touch with everything that you're doing in the future with the future um, book writing and everything else? Well, um, thank you for asking. I have got a new website. 
and I'm working on getting it. It's not live yet, but we're working on getting it done. But that address will be my name, terrylynnweaver.org. And we will have new stuff coming up here within the next month. I'll be kind of quiet on my Facebook stuff right now because because you can go on there. But uh, I'm going to be busy writing, so I'm going to stay uh, hibernating these next couple couple months while it's kind of cold out and uh, work on getting a book done on my family's uh, journey from Brasovic, Yugoslavia, October 1944 during World War II. It's quite a story. It's an amazing story. Wow. That's awesome. Well, as soon as you've got that site up live, let me know and I'll add it to the description of the of I'll our episode. It. I sure awesome. will. And I thank you so much. And thank you for what you do and getting the word out. And I wish you the best and blessings that your podcast uh, reaches lots of folk. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Terry Lynn. It was great having you. We'll have you on again. And thank you all for listening. We've been Forge and Anvil. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.